Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Kerry Parker. Today we have episode 371 for April 8th, 2024. And today we are finally going to be doing a mailbag episode. My original goal was to do like a Dear Carry question, you know, with the new shows, kind of like I do the tip of the week. Every once in a while, uh, I'd, I'd work in a Dear Carry question. But the new shows are just so packed uh, that I never have time for that. So I figured that, you know, when I actually need a week off, that would be a great time to do uh, a catch up Dear Carry mailbag episode. And that is what we are doing today. Uh, real quick, before we get into that, the patron promotion is still going on. You can go to fdsd.me slash promo 424. Uh, we've already got a couple of new patrons. That's great. So if you want to get one of those super cool dragon challenge coins, you have until the end of April uh, to do that. But the treasure chest aspect to this promotion is going to be something I'm just going to have uh, as an ongoing basis, at least until the prizes run out. One more thing I was thinking about, we're about a quarter into the year since we're just starting April. And I was just curious how many of you have kept up with your New Year's resolutions. And I listed several of those that I thought would be good for this year. So if you missed that, or if you forgot about that, you can go back and check out my 2024 New Year's resolutions blog article for some great ideas and, and see if you've managed to take care of any of those so far. I will, of course, put a link to that in the show notes. So remember, the way this works is if you've got a question for me, send your questions to Dear Carrie at Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. If you want more details, go to fdsd.me slash QNA. And what you may have forgotten is that I actually draw a name out of the hat, a digital hat, once a month for people who have submitted me Dear Carry questions. And if you win, I send you a free PDF copy of my book. That's been going on all this time. You may not have known it, and I should have probably made a point of saying that more often. So when I get your question, I usually try to respond, you know, pretty quickly, you know, give me a few days. And then I just kind of set that aside and keep that as a candidate for these mailbag shows. So keep in mind as we're going through these today that I have probably edited some of these questions for clarity or, or brevity. They're not always 100% verbatim, though I try to do that where I can. Also, not everybody gave their name uh, or location. Some do, some don't. So if I don't mention it, that's because they didn't tell me. So with that as our setup, let's get to the mailbag and let's answer your Dear Carrie questions. All right, first up, we have a question from Guy L. from Canada. Uh, and Guy asks, I've recently returned from a trip overseas. I've been an avid listener to your podcast when you frequently recommend using 2FA. My recent experience with 2FA was less than ideal. In fact, it prevented me from accessing several of my accounts because they would not ask me to verify my identity through my phone by sending me a text message. Since I was using a different SIM card in my phone at the time to access the internet locally, I was unable to verify my ID. Even after switching back to my home SIM card, I was still unable to receive the verification text messages. I use a password manager with complex password and unique user IDs whenever possible, and use 2FA only when I am forced to do so. I found that 2FA broke the internet for me. I understand, <laughs> I understand that you do a fair bit of traveling. How do you manage to make this work for you? An avid listener key. All right, we went back and forth a little bit on email on this, and it turns out apparently that uh, in Canada, uh, they're kind of behind the times with 2FA. A lot of places don't apparently allow it. And if they do, they only allow the SMS or the text-based version. They don't do the TOTP or the time-based one-time password method with the authenticator apps like Google Authenticator, Authy, Aegis, etc. So first of all, I do travel internationally, not as often as I'd like, but I do. When I do, honestly, I just suck up and pay pay the 10 bucks a day to have my international service. When you, when you do that with AT&T, at least, basically you take your service with you wherever you go. I mean, it's just like you're at home. You get calls like normal. I have an unlimited plan, so it's unlimited in, in uh, Europe or wherever I'm going as well. Yeah, it's kind of pricey, but for the convenience and for situations like this, uh, I, I just usually suck it up and pay it. So obviously this is a problem with text-based SMS. I mean, one of many, uh, the one I usually talk about is that it's not terribly secure. Uh, the SMS messages are not that private and in SIM swapping attacks, if I can clone your phone, then, then I can get those same messages that you're getting. And therefore I could potentially use that to get into your accounts. But here's another case where that is not, that is an inconvenient thing, because if you're using a local SIM card, which means you basically now have a local phone number wherever you are, because that's probably cheaper than doing what, what I do. If you just want to you know get on the internet, you, you buy a local SIM card. And then if you're going to be there long enough, I guess you can give out that phone number to somebody if they can give you a call. Now it's a, it's a long distance or international call to them, but you could use VoIP apps and things like that. Once you're on the internet, you, you know, the, the regular phone number stuff isn't that big of a deal. 
However, in this case, it's a very big deal because <laughs> that's what you need in order to get those two-factor authentication codes. They are, they're being sent. They're going to the network uh, waiting to be delivered to your phone. But if your phone is not active on the network, you're never going to get those. And if you're using a local SIM card instead of your home SIM card, then you're not going to get them. Now, a lot of phones today support dual SIMs, so you could actually be doing both if you wanted to. But this person is trying to avoid the cost of doing that. And oddly, even when they put their SIM card back in, it didn't work. My, my guess is that they had not set up international roaming automatically uh, before they had left. So th their service wasn't supporting them getting international text messages without paying. That, that's just my guess. I'm not 100% sure. So what else can you do? Well, in this case, there's not a whole lot you can do. Maybe if you have the dual SIM set up and you can set up a text only international roaming, uh, you could do that. I don't know if any providers do that, though. That would be a really nice service to have. You would hope that would be a lot cheaper than doing text and voice. But, you know, <laughs> cellular providers have you over a barrel and they're not really that interested in giving you good options. You might be able to register that new international number as a second number to receive two-factor authentication codes while you're there, but I doubt that would work either. But another option you might try is if you get a VoIP, a voice over IP phone number that accepts text messages, like uh, something from Hushed or MySudo, then you may be able to use that for your uh, 2FA code recipient phone number, and then that would work anywhere you have internet service, and it wouldn't be tied to your cell phone phone number. It would just be tied to this VoIP number. The only trouble with that is some of these 2FA services don't allow you to use well-known VoIP providers. They actually block those numbers for use for 2FA. So uh, this is a really good question, and there's not a lot of great answers to it. I will say that if you have a Macintosh computer, uh, you can have your text messages forwarded to your to your Mac. I think that is actually done via the phone, though. So I'm not sure if that would work either. In other words, if you had an iPad with you or a Mac laptop with you, uh, and it was set to also get your, your text messages, if you could then get those devices on the internet through potentially through a hotspot on your phone using the local SIM card, maybe you would still get text messages that way, but I'm not 100% sure. I think they actually use your phone for that service to forward them, and I don't think that would work. So unfortunately, not a lot of great options there. If you really need to get on those accounts, I think you're kind of stuck just paying for international roaming. All right, next question. And this one's from Kathy. What is your opinion on routinely changing passwords in accounts that have not necessarily been known to be compromised? I know that years ago it was thought to be good practice to do this routinely, but that practice seems to encourage poor password choices. Very true. I'd been under the impression that I should change passwords only if the site is known to be or thought to be compromised. What is the latest recommendation? I find it confusing since so many experts have differences of opinion on this topic. I trust you and your expertise. I trust you and your expertise. I use MFA wherever I can and even hardware keys were allowed, plus a password manager. Thanks in advance, Carrie. Okay, so I actually wrote about this in my book. It's got a kind of interesting backstory. A lot of this advice, I think, originally could be traced back to a National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST policy, that said you should be rotating your passwords and changing them frequently. And in the book, I talk about this. It's actually traced back to a guy named Bill Burr, who he got this from a white paper that was written in the 1980s. He has since recanted. He has apologized for this. And NIST has removed that from their security recommendations for the reasons that Kathy mentioned, which is that what people do invariably, because they're trying to remember these passwords, is they'll come up with, you know, Go Boilers. Well, I've got to change it every three months. So, okay, maybe Go Boilers 1 or Go Boilers 2 and then Go Boilers 3. To the point where I think a lot of companies that are doing this, and you see this often in companies, is they actually will tell you, no, 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 you can't have a password that's very similar to the one you just had. And of course, the only way they should know that, uh, because if they've stored the password as a hash, there's no way they could do that comparison as you're trying to update your password. But what they often do is have you enter your old password along with your new password. So then they do have both of them right there unhashed, and they could see you know, lexically, they only, they only differ by a character or you could, they can tell that you're incrementing a number or something like that. And they'll say, no, 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 I can't do that. So yes, it does tend to uh, encourage bad password habits, but here's the thing. So at a company, what, the reason companies do this and why, why their policies could be different from yours is, is they are trying to not only keep bad guys out, but they're trying to keep even like former employees out or people who have changed groups because a lot of this stuff is compartmentalized. These passwords are not just necessarily your account password. They might be access to certain systems. 
And so they don't want people who leave a group to be able to get back into and access stuff that their old group could access, you know, in perpetuity. Or if they leave the company and maybe they're a disgruntled employee and they maybe shared that password with somebody. Anyway, the point is that from the corporate level, when you've got all these people and all these parts moving around, this compartmentalization going on, there, there are various reasons why passwords might get shared or you might uh, be using them for common things. And you don't want old employees, either for the group or for the company, having access to some of that stuff. So you want to put a window on it so that there's only a certain window of opportunity when those passwords are going to work. Because if you rotate them every three months or every six months, then that whenever those rotate, whoever had that password before can no longer use it. And make no mistake, this has happened a lot. Like this is, this is a common security uh, hacking, well, not even a hacking story, because if you don't change these passwords and former employees leave knowing those passwords, then they can get back in to the, to the company and get up to mischief. And it definitely has happened. So that that's different from you personally uh, with your personal accounts. And I agree with Kathy. I think the current thinking here is as long as you are using a password manager, as long as you have strong, unique passwords for all of your accounts, and the only way to do that is with a password manager, for example, again, I don't know any of my passwords, like any of them, except for my master password for my vault. Uh, all the rest of them are junk, uh, completely random, unmemorizable gibberish. And so those are really strong passwords, and, and they're all unique. So I really am not terribly worried about any individual one of them, and I'm certainly not rotating them on a periodic basis. I've got way too many passwords for that to be a viable thing. Now, some password managers actually have kind of cool built-in functions, like a one-button password change. That's cool. If we would ever get off our butts and actually standardize APIs for for updating and changing and setting passwords, uh, you know, with some standardization, then we could actually do this a lot more easier. If we had that, then our password managers, you could just go to them and say, you know what, I, I I'm feeling a little weird. Change all my passwords, and it would should be able to uh, if there was a standard for this go through and reliably change every password it knows about, but we are nowhere near there yet. I, and why, why I don't know. It seems so straightforward, so simple. And yet sometimes it's those things we just, <laughs> we, we never get done. So anyway, uh, there's no reason for you to rotate your passwords. If you think that a uh, some account has been compromised. If you're feeling weird about it at all, then sure, change your password. It's pretty easy to do with your password manager on a one-time basis. That's fine. But changing all your passwords on a periodic basis, nah. I don't think I don't think we need to do that. The only thing I'll add to that is if, if you shared a password with somebody for any reason whatsoever, you wanted to grant them temporary access to one of your accounts. I don't recommend doing that. Or, but you know, if you if you did that, then as soon as that is done, I would definitely change that password. And by the way, with password managers, you can actually set up secure ways to uh, allow people to access passwords kind of without them being able to see it. I don't know if that's 100% secure, but uh, it's a pretty nice feature. Uh, but nevertheless, anytime I, you've shared something with somebody, when you're done sharing, I would change that password. Okay, next question. Uh, I've set up my network as explained in your book using a guest network for Wi-Fi and setting it so devices on the guest network can't see each other. I've also turned off UPnP or universal plug and play, which is fantastic. So on this week's podcast, which was some time ago, you mentioned an IoT device getting compromised. How does this happen? If the device is acting as the client connecting to a server, unless the server gets compromised, how can someone connect to my IoT device to compromise it? Doesn't my router block unsolicited connections from the internet? All right, so great question. So the real question here is, where is the attacker? Where are they coming from? In most cases, uh, the bad guys are trying to get into your network from the outside. And I mean that both logically and probably physically. So they're somewhere out on the broader internet. They're probably not sitting next to your house or parked in a car outside your, your apartment. They're probably just somewhere on the internet scanning, looking for vulnerabilities and trying to get into people's networks. So yes, your router is the gateway to your home network. It is your bouncer. It is the thing that keeps anybody from getting through that door that's not been approved. And generally speaking, the way that works is it doesn't allow any unsolicited requests coming from the outside to come into your network. The only way communication happens in your home network with all your devices is something in your network first reaches out to the internet and then a response comes back or makes a connection to something out in the internet that establishes that connection and then traffic can go back and forth between those two. So they need to get past your router first, uh, which is blocking access via firewall. That's what's going on here. The firewall is what's blocking this traffic. It's like a one-way data valve. 
but also through the NAT function, the network address translation function. You really don't know how to address anything on somebody's private network because those private IP addresses aren't, well, they're not public. So you wouldn't even necessarily know how to make an unsolicited request to something in that network. So the way IoT devices in your network might get compromised are probably one of uh, three things. First of all, maybe your router is messed up. Your router has a security bug and they're able to get into your router. And then once they're into your router, they can, they can have access from a networking perspective to anything on your home network. And that might be something as dumb as you have UPnP turned on for the WAN side, for the internet side of your of your router, which nobody should have turned on, or there you you might have you know holes poked in your firewall somehow, either via UPnP on the inside on the on the LAN side, or maybe at some point you configured that and forgot about it, so there's an open port. And by the way, you can test this for the most part by going to Shields Up, and I'll I'll put a link in the show notes that it will do a you can ask Shields Up to scan your home IP address to see if there's any open ports. It's not 100% accurate because your ISP might be getting in the way of that scan. But anyway, it's something you can use to test this. But if there was something wrong with your router or if there are holes in your firewall, then that would allow somebody from the broader internet to start poking around at the devices inside your network. And of course, then they've got to find one with a vulnerability and compromise it. Now, it's possible someone might be able to do this with physical proximity. So if they're, you know, your neighbor or if you're in an apartment complex uh, or a dorm or something like that, where it's very dense, there's a lot of people that might be able to kind of see your network. That would also mean if they're that if they're close enough that they could actually connect to your router, that they also could perhaps sniff some of the network traffic uh, between your devices and your router if they're on Wi-Fi. And if they were able to do that and figure out what those devices were and maybe find that one of those devices has a vulnerability, it could be Wi-Fi, could be Bluetooth, yeah, they might be able to compromise a device that way. And so from that perspective, they're logically inside your network because they are able to potentially directly interact with the wirelessly interact with the devices on your home network. That's what happened in the classic Vegas casino hack where somebody got into a smart thermometer in a aquarium inside the casino, figured out how to compromise that, which was on the local network. And then from there was able to get to more juicy ta targets inside the network and exfiltrate some pretty serious data. Also, potentially, if you have people come to your house and they, you know, and they get on your Wi-Fi network, you give them the password to your Wi-Fi network. If they are bringing a, a compromised device onto your network, the first thing I would do if I, if I was malware running on one of these devices is, hey, I'm on a new network. Let's see what else I can find. Let's see if I can corrupt uh, some other devices. And then, of course, as the listener said, if the devices themselves are talking to servers in the cloud, which they almost all are, that's kind of the whole thing about being a smart device. If they are talking to a server that has somehow been compromised, then yes, that would be another way, potentially, for your devices to be compromised. For example, you know, maybe a, a malicious software update for that device. And there's, there's not a whole lot you can do about that. So the bottom line of this question is, is what can I do to mitigate these threats? Now I did a whole series of articles on, on securing your home network. I definitely recommend you check that out. Look, look for a link in the show notes to the first article on that. But in this case, what you want to do really is you want to put your, your, your least secure devices, the ones that are most vulnerable, which is probably your IOT devices that are cheap. I would put those on your guest network. Almost every router today has the capability of having two different Wi-Fi segregated Wi-Fi networks, uh, a guest network and a regular network. By default, it just has a regular network. But if you enable the guest network, then I would put as many of your IOT devices on that guest network as you can. That keeps them segregated. At least if they get infected, they will kind of got to stay infected by, the, by themselves. It's kind of like having two areas of the doctor's office, right? There's the well, the well half and the sick half. I remember that mostly when I was going to, to the pediatrician with my kids. So wherever possible, uh, put those devices on your guest network. So great question. Thanks for asking. All right, next up, and this is from Math from Northern Europe. And I'm thinking that may be short for Matthias. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, Math says, I recently bought a hardware security key because I heard you and others recommend this to improve your operational security. My question involves the privacy of these keys. From what I understand, they are recognized instantly by the computer as a USB HID device or human interface device. Can these be uniquely tracked when you register them to online services like Facebook or Google by data brokers? Thanks for everything you do, math. So first of all, the obvious part of this, if you're logging into Facebook or Google, there's no tracking to be done. They, they, you're logging in, you're telling them who you are. But what I thought was more interesting about this question is, can these devices be queried by web pages that you visit and perhaps used to fingerprint you? 
So here, here's what I'm thinking. So these devices, these kind of YubiKeys and other similar devices, when you're using them for two-factor authentication, you plug them into your computer. Generally, you leave them plugged in. You don't have to, but I think a lot of people do. In fact, a lot of them are designed to be so low profile, like on laptops, for example, that you stick them into the port and you almost can't see them. They're so so small. Because the idea being when you go to a website and you need to log in, well, you, you tap this thing on the side, which says, yes, there's a real human present, cough up the, the security key for this website passkey or two-factor authentication code or whatever you've set up. But this device, this, these security keys often act as keyboards. In fact, if you kind of look at the operating systems view of that through like list all my USB devices, they're often like keyboard devices. In this case, what we're talking about a, an HID, a human interface device. And if you look at these devices, if you, for instance, on a Mac, if you go to your system settings and, and you do a, a profile of your computer, system info and get a report and find the USB tab or line on the list of things, it will list all your USB devices. And if you look at those devices, each one of them has got a, like, I don't know, like 10 different parameters that you can, that you can read about those devices. It'll tell you the make, the manufacturer, sometimes a serial number, sometimes uh, software version numbers. It'll give you a lot of information about that device. And I think what this person is getting at is, well, if web pages can access these devices and they kind of have to in some limited way, at least, because when you're logging in, that's the, the web page is kind of asking you, hey, all right, I'm ready. Give me your secret key. And then you tap the you tap the little security key and it coughs up a response to the challenge, which you know says, yep, that's really me. So if I can talk to that USB device somehow, can I query it and get its information such that I might be able to fingerprint that user. Like if I, if, if I could get all the USB devices, that's going to be a pretty unique set of things for a, a given person, especially if I can drill all the way down to like the make model and maybe even serial number of each of those devices. So as an ex software engineer, I looked into this uh, the way uh, an engineer would, I thought, okay, so these web pages must have some sort of an API, which means that the HTML language or maybe JavaScript has an API, an application programming interface to say, hey, I've loaded this web page and I might want to talk to some USB devices. Tell me what USB devices you've got. You know, maybe I want to find your webcam. Maybe I want to find a microphone. Maybe for whatever reason, I want to query the list of all available USB devices. Well, there is an API for this. It's called Web USB. Uh, Google came out with it and put it in Chrome. I think it's been adopted now as a broader web standard. Though, I, nevertheless, I, from what I can tell, I don't think Firefox and Safari support it, or at least not, not completely. And some of the reasons given for that was this fingerprinting problem. But nevertheless, you can't just ask for all devices. If you do that, you're going to get an answer of zero. I tried it. <laughs> it. It says, I find no devices. And my computer has a lot of devices plugged in. So I knew that was not true. And looking into it a little bit more, you need to be able to grant permissions. And the way, that, apparently the way you grant permissions with this particular API is you don't, you can't just come out of the gate and ask for all of them. You have to ask for individual ones first. And you have to do it by vendor ID. Uh, among other things, you can give it a, a few different filters, but you got to be more specific. It, you're saying, I'm looking for this device from this company. So you might say, well, I'm looking for a YubiKey. I looked up the vendor code for YubiKey. I wrote a little JavaScript for this and did a query and it, it still didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is because I have to be in an HTTPS context for, for to even call this API. Now, I'm not going to get into too much more details, but at the end of the day, what I found out is that it looks like you can't really do this broad of a request, which means you should not be able to use this web USB API for fingerprinting. And by the way, I used Brave for this. Normally I use Firefox, but I keep Brave on hand for situations like this. Brave is based on the Chromium browser, so it does support this web USB API. But even with the Brave browser, I couldn't do it. Now, I didn't take this all the way because to take this all the way, I would actually have to set up a web server, set up HTTPS, you know, come up with a valid certificate for that device for TLS. I, I didn't do all that to do this, but what, what it looks like to me is that you would need to get some permissions to do this. So I don't think right now, unless there's a bug or a vulnerability in some of this code that would allow you to do this, that you can't just kind of generically for, as a web page say, tell me about all these USB devices, or even tell me about this specific device without some sort of a pop-up to the user with you having to grant permission for them to do so. So it couldn't be done surreptitiously. So anyway, that was a very interesting question. Thank you for asking. All right, next up, this is from Braden. Braden says, Dear Carrie, do you have any recommendations for a privacy-focused mail client for Mac? 
I'm not looking for something like ProtonMail, but a client alternative to Apple Mail. To my understanding, Apple Mail, the Mac and iOS app, has privacy protection where it blocks pixel tracking and such. So I'm wondering if you know of another mail client, ideally Mac OS or iOS, that blocks trackers embedded in, into emails, most notably marketing emails. Thank you very much. Best, Braden. So the Mac Mail app, both for Mac OS and iOS, is good about privacy. It's got some interesting privacy features built in, including hide my email and private relay. And it's also got some interesting ways to throw off a lot of this pixel tracking. And just as a quick reminder, the way this pixel tracking works is uh, most email today is like multimedia. It's like an HTML web page where it's not just text. It's also images and other things that can be embedded in that email. And the way they track you with images is instead of saying the way it normally works on a web page is let's say I've got a picture of, I don't know, some, some corporate logo. And if you put that in the bottom of your email, maybe in the, the footer of your email, there's a little piece of descriptive code in there that says, when it comes to this part right here, you want to go fetch this image from, from this server over here. This is where that image lives. And you give the image name logo.png, let's say. But the way the tracking versions of that works is instead of giving it logo.png, you give it logo dash some weird, long, crazy, unique identifier dot PNG. And you do that specifically and differently for every person you send that email to. So that when you get a request for logo dash some specific identifier dot PNG, I know who I sent that to. So I know that they are now reading that email because they are now asking for that image. And I know, you know, a lot more about it because I, I can see the IP address that, that is requesting that image. So I can probably tell roughly where they're located and I might be able to even track them based on that if I've seen that IP address before. So that is how a lot of tracking is done on these marketing emails. And that requires no work on your part. If you have your uh, mail app or whatever set to automatically load images, it's going to do that every time automatically. And those people are going to get that information. Now, again, Apple's built in some interesting technologies around this. I think the way theirs works is they actually preload that stuff from a server on the internet so that it all comes from some generic Apple IP address, not your IP address. And it's all done well before you ever open the email. So it gives them some information, but it's not nearly as good as information as, as if they had gotten it from your computer or your smartphone particularly. Another way that a lot of these marketing emails track you is if there are any links in there whatsoever, and that includes buttons that you could click on, images you can click on that would take you to some website. As soon as you click on those links, regardless of what those links say they are, they are very often redirect links. And so they go off to some other server first, and then they take you to your final destination. And that's top. And that hop off point is doing the same thing that the pixel tracking is doing. They're getting information about you when you clicked on that link. So what can you do about that? Well, first of all, you should probably turn off automatic loading of images in any of your mail clients. That is something that a lot of them are starting to do that are privacy focused right by default. And that's why they're doing it. But as far as other mail clients, besides the Apple mail client, uh, you can look at Thunderbird. It's kind of clunky, to be honest, but it does have some of these features built in and it's cross platform. It's made by Mozilla. So you could check that out if you want. But what honestly, what I do for the most part is I, I read almost all my email in my web browser using browser based mail clients. So I go to proton.me log in and I check my mail that way. And as a matter of fact, a lot of the quote unquote desktop apps or even mobile apps that you're running are really just the web apps with a, a container around them because these software engineers don't want to write this app more than once if they don't have to. So they write a really nice web version. And then if you want to have a quote unquote native app on your smartphone or your computer, they just take most of that same code and put it in a little kind of a wrapper that makes kind of a web app into a regular app. But in that case, you can't control the container's privacy settings as much as you can in a regular browser app. So I use my browser's built-in privacy protections, including things like uBlock Origin and Privacy Badger, and just run my mail clients in my browser itself. I certainly wouldn't trust standalone apps like Outlook or Gmail or Yahoo's mail app. They're all pushing very hard to get you to run their app. And the reason they're doing that is because they want to track you. So I would use the web apps whenever you can with a good privacy respecting browser like Brave or Firefox or even Safari with a couple key plugins where necessary and use that to read your mail. All right, next up, this is from Mark. And Mark just says, if I give my Alexa permission to access other devices on my network, would that even be possible if that device was on my guest network? 
So this actually go, kind of goes back to the one we just talked about. So let's just, let's say you've done as I recommend, and you've taken your most vulnerable, your least secure, your most shady IoT devices, and you've put those on your guest network, and then you keep your phone and your, your computer uh, on the regular network. If you follow that, let's say you put all of your, you know, your Amazon Echo devices on your guest network. So if you do that, and if your router is functioning properly, then no, uh, any devices on your guest network would not have any local network access to any of the devices on your regular Wi-Fi network. That's the whole point. Now, there are ways that kind of look like they're working around that, but in reality, they're not. There are situations where these devices talk to each other via a internet proxy, which basically means their internet server. So uh, if the Echo devices are smart enough and they're looking around the network and saying, look, I, uh, first of all, I know this person, I know it's Kerry. I know he has three Echo devices, but I'm looking around my local network and I'm not seeing them, but I can check back with the home server and says, yeah, he's still got three. In fact, there's three on the internet right now. If I'm working back through Amazon, then those devices could talk to each other by bouncing off of Amazon's server. So they, they're not talking to each other between the guest network and your regular network. They're actually going out to the internet and coming back. Uh, and that's how they're kind of avoiding that barrier. So in this case, these affiliated devices, and they don't have to be affiliated through the mother company. There could be third party stuff going on here as well. And, and actually Echo devices are a good example of that because Echo devices have these skills that you can install, which are plugins for the devices that let them do other things with the third party vendors. And those plugins may be talking to each other uh, either through the lo local network, if all the devices are on the same half of your guest versus regular network, or by bouncing off the internet and coming back and talking to each other that way. And it may be that well, what's a good example? Maybe Sonos. So maybe you've got a, a Sonos skill installed on your Amazon Echo. And so you've got an Amazon Echo device owned, owned and made by Amazon. And then you've got Sonos speakers that are also, that are made by somebody else completely different. But the, the common factor there is this Sonos plugin is allowing them to talk to the other Sonos devices, either by going out to the internet and coming back, or if they're all on the same partition of your network, they may be able to talk to each other as well. So since we're talking about this one more time, I will bring up one more aspect to this that can be problematic. And that is if you need these devices to not just talk to each other, but if you need them to talk to, let's say your smartphone to control them, for example, uh, you, you've got a bunch of Sono speakers and you want to send music to them that may prevent you from having them on the guest network, or you may have to at least temporarily move your smartphone from your home network to your guest network so that you can control them. But hopefully, hopefully the way that can work is that you can control them by bouncing off of Sonos servers so that you can go from your smartphone, which is on your regular home network, sending a command out through the internet and then back to your guest network on the other side where you can talk to your Sonos speakers that way. It's less efficient. Maybe that doesn't work well for streamed audio, but that could theoretically work. But that is one situation where sometimes you can't segregate those devices because you need, uh, you know, your kind of important devices, your smartphones, your computers to be able to directly talk to uh, those devices on the network. And they can't do that if they're on two separate halves of your home network. All right, let's move on. Now, I got a couple questions here from Ray from Toronto, Canada, and Ray has sent me a lot of great questions over the years, and I've got a couple of them here. First of all. With bad actor hacking always finding ways to take advantage of security holes in technology, I've often wondered, how do they know where to look? Do you have any bigger picture ideas for how, for instance, just one bit of code on just one chip of a whole phone or computer or car can be known about and be exploited? Would someone somewhere need to know the detailed composition of those devices and the minutia of those components and happen to be well-versed enough in its programming to be able to see the flaw somewhere? Or is it more a matter of trying everything they can think of everywhere possible to see if anything works, like throwing spaghetti at a wall to see what sticks? It seems that technology is moving so fast, it would be hard for anyone anywhere to be able to keep up with understanding its details, let alone so well versed in it that they would know where to look for softer targets. That is a great question. And as a software engineer and somebody who has just dabbled a little bit in some of the hacking, here, here's basically what's going on. So first of all, yes, it definitely helps to know the product you're trying to hack. If you're a high level hacker, a nation state hacker, a government, law enforcement, that kind of thing, then yes, you're going to be doing some homework. You're going to be hiring people that have specific knowledge on specific products. You know, the, the more popular ones, you're going to want, you know, somebody who knows Linux, you're going to want somebody who knows Microsoft Exchange, 
uh, you know, the, the, the popular products out there, you're going to want people that have specific knowledge uh, to help them know where to look. However, uh, yeah, a lot of it is also spray and pray. A lot of it's just shotgun approach where uh, there are tools, very, very good tools uh, for hackers that anybody can download right now. And they have built into them specific mechanisms for trying to find devices on the network, trying to figure out what kind of devices they are. They can probe them in various ways to try to figure out the make model uh, version of, of the things that they're talking to. They can then easily look up known vulnerabilities for those things and then come right back and automatically exploit a lot of them. Now, how did those tools get created? So the funny thing about hacking and the way a lot of this stuff works is there's a very few smart people who figure this stuff out and then they make it available to everybody through tools like these and now anybody can do it. But there's also this notion that, you know, the, all these things are so different and there are all these different products. How could you possibly know enough about any of these things to figure them out? Really, there aren't that different. There's a lot of commonality in these devices. For example, almost all IoT devices, lots of computing devices actually are running a common operating system, Linux. And that operating system is open source, so you can everybody can see what's going on in there. When known vulnerabilities come up in the Linux kernel or in the Linux operating system, that affects a lot of things. They also use a lot of standardized protocols, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, TLS, DNS, DHCP. There, there, there's, there's a lot of commonality in these devices, despite being made by different people. And a lot of these protocols are really complicated and they do have holes. And if you don't implement them properly, uh, that could be a vector for attack. And so a lot of these tools, understanding these well-known well-documented, well, <laughs> documented protocols, they have mechanisms that are specifically designed to try to mess them up. It's called fuzzing, but they also have just standard attack vectors. There are certain ways that we can exploit Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, for example. And so these tools, I already have that built in. And even though I'm talking a lot about software here, that's also true in hardware. Even though there's a lot of different manufacturers making a lot of different products, they often come down to very common chipsets. The brains and a lot of these things, the, the, the Wi-Fi controllers and a lot of these things, the Bluetooth controllers, the NFC controllers, uh, a lot of this hardware ends up being the same, just packaged differently. So really it's a combination of the, of the thing you're talking about. Uh, there are absolutely cases where specific devices want to be targeted. And so we have to have domain knowledge about that device, but also there's a lot of commonality in our smart devices that allows for tools to be built to find common vulnerabilities in those things. So great question. Now Ray's next question has at least a couple different aspects to it. And I'm going to try to read kind of parts of a rather long email exchange we, we had on this. Uh, so dear Carrie, I recently found on a flight that one of my well-rated privacy oriented VPNs, tunnel bear, if you're up for mentioning it, wouldn't work with the in-flight Wi-Fi. It's simply never connected despite several attempts. When I got in touch with the VPN company about it later, I was told that some ISPs, and, and that's the airline in this case, don't allow VPNs to operate on the networks, period. Which, of course, defeats the purpose of having a VPN to use on a public Wi-Fi connection. Is that a common problem on flights? But further still, I confirmed that even if I had been able to connect with that VPN, that company doesn't allow streaming while the VPN is operating, even to legitimate registered accounts. I looked at a couple other highly rated privacy focused VPNs like iVPN and Mul Mulvad, and they said respectively that they don't allow streaming or it depends on the server and service being used, whether streaming works or not. Even sitting in an airport and on a data signal, which I, I'm guessing means Wi-Fi, or maybe cellular data, neither Netflix nor Disney Plus would work for me when I was using iVPN. Why or how does a private secure VPN service seemingly necessarily not allow streaming? And is there anything we could do about that other than using less private secure VPN options? Thanks for any insight you can offer, Ray. All right, so let's back up. As always with VPNs, it really depends on your threat model or your usage case. Why are you using a VPN? What aspects of the, what a VPN brings to the table are you wanting to exploit for your purposes? One is certainly privacy, and that is if you're on uh, somebody's Wi-Fi that you don't trust, and I would certainly put airplane Wi-Fi in that category, but you're, you know, you're a coffee shop or a hotel or you know McDonald's or whatever. If you're going to use the Wi-Fi, and I usually don't, I usually just use my cellular data plan and hotspot, but if you're going to do it, then I would absolutely recommend that you use a VPN in that case. But also, Ray was trying to use the VPN to stream Netflix. 
and I actually wasn't aware of this, so I, I'm, I appreciate the question. I didn't realize that some of these privacy-focused VPNs actually don't allow you to stream, you know, things like Netflix and Disney Plus over their services. I thought that was interesting. Usually that's blocked by the service itself. And it happens quite a bit, actually, because they don't want you because this content that you're accessing is licensed and that licensing is geographically bound so that the licenses vary from country to country or region to region. And so if you are out of your home region, if you have a U.S. Netflix account and you are in Europe and you want to access your Netflix stuff, they're not going to let you do that from Europe. So enter VPN. Let's get a VPN service where I can pop out of the Internet underground hole you know, from Europe and pop out in America and appear to be coming from the USA and Netflix should say, Oh, this person's local. Let's let them access their account and stream their content. But a lot of these services, because they are contractually obligated to do so based on the contracts they have signed for the content that they are providing and trying to lock into regional access, they just kind of blanket block any known IP addresses that belong to VPN services. That's not uncommon. What is uncommon and what I didn't realize actually happened until we got until I heard from Ray is that some of these services just don't even bother to do that anyway, which I think is interesting. So the other thing I would think about it from the airlines perspective is I could see them trying to block VPN access because then, you know, you might be doing something nefarious or something that breaks their terms of service or something and they would not have any recourse uh, or any way to try to block you from doing that. So I can see how the airline potentially might be blocking all VPNs. And so it, there are protocols for setting up VPN connections. So it might be smart enough, the airplane might be smart enough to prevent that from happening, or it may be blocking known IP addresses for VPN servers. There's a lot of ways it could do that. There are also ways it could be doing that unintentionally because a lot of these kind of weird ISPs like, you know, mom and pop coffee shops, certainly airlines, you know, maybe hotels, things like that. What you'll often see with these when you're trying to access their local internet, they'll, you know, they say, here's, here's the Wi-Fi, and here's your password, here's how to access it. The way those often work is no matter what site you try to go to, let's say you're trying to go to tunnelbear.com, you put in tunnelbear.com or your VPN app under the covers is basically doing that. And no matter what you put in, it goes straight to the hotels. Hey, welcome to the hotel Wi-Fi. Here's how you check in, enter your user ID and password, which is, you know, maybe a room number or maybe an email address or whatever. It's called a captive portal. And so no matter where you try to go to first, it always redirects you somewhere else. And even though this practice, this super annoying practice has been around for a long time now, there are still some VPN clients that can't handle that. And again, these, these captive portals, we probably could have come up with some sort of IETF spec around how those work, which would have standardized it, which would have let all these things work together better, and we just haven't. So I don't know about this particular situation on the airline, but that is certainly a, a situation where I have seen VPNs fail to connect because under the covers, the local ISP, the local Wi-Fi provider is doing everything it can not to let you go where you're trying to go. In other words, and not to connect to your VPN server, but instead, first, you have to go to this captive portal where you have to sign in and agree to the terms of service and yada, 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 before you can go somewhere else. And that little dance often is enough to throw off uh, VPN connections. One thing I will note as far as using VPNs is today, the vast, vast majority of connections that your computer or your smartphone and the apps that run on them make to the internet are encrypted in and of themselves. Each of those individual connections is HTTPS effectively or TLS. Um, so from a privacy perspective, while you're still leaking metadata, like the your ISP, whoever's letting you get on the internet can still see where you're going, how much data you're transferring, and that sort of thing. They can't read the contents of that information, generally speaking. I would still use a VPN anyway, but just it's less important now for the privacy perspective as it used to be. All right, let's move on to my last question. And this one's kind of tricky, and I'm definitely going to have to paraphrase parts of this and kind of pick and choose which parts I answer. This person was in a very interesting situation, David, who had been a victim of identity theft and was also participating in, it sounds like, several types of cryptocurrency. Uh, and because of the identity theft and because of hacking, apparently lost a lot of their crypto. But there was also this other weird case where they were dealing with a company called Celsius. And I guess Celsius, and apparently Celsius was involved in crypto. They went through bankruptcy and then were coming back out of bankruptcy and were trying to 
refund some of their coins back to their, uh, their customers. And with that coming up, this person was worried about the, the security of their phone, especially after just going through identity theft. So what I told David, first of all, uh, and what I will tell all of you, <laughs> is that I am not a cryptocurrency expert. However, I know a few experts, and I know some websites that can help uh, with this sort of stuff, including two of my favorite sites, which is privacyguides.org and techlore.tech. They both have some interesting information about cryptocurrency and privacy and security. Uh, so I referred David to them. I also referred David to some government-backed identity theft sites. There's identitytheft.gov and sysa.gov has some great information on preventing and responding to identity theft. Uh, and also NerdWallet, I found a good, interesting article there. So, so I said, and I say this to some of the people who send me their Jerry Carey questions, if it's outside my specific area of expertise, or if I feel that it's, you know, life-threatening or having to do with something that is, that is very, very serious and I would hate to give improper advice, I often refer them to other places. So from the cryptocurrency aspect of this, uh, I mostly refer to other things. I did mention some things I have learned along the way, and that is, you know, there are things with cryptocurrency called hot wallets and cold wallets. Uh, hot wallets is basically an online repository or an uh, online access to an account where you let them manage your cryptocurrency for you. So they are really the custodian of your coins and you're trusting them. <laughs> Today, I would never, ever, ever do that. So a cold wallet is actually like a, you can, you can keep it locally on your machine uh, and only you have control of it. Meaning that if you lose access to that thing, you've lost all your crypto. So that's part of the risk you take when you want to have full control over your coins. Uh, also, there are hardware wallets you can buy, you know, kind of like a YubiKey kind of thing where you can have a hardware security device where you can actually store your stuff there as well. Uh, I've heard good things about those, but that's about all I think I'm qualified perhaps to say on that topic. But in a follow-up email with David, uh, David said that he th thinks he may have m downloaded a malicious file to his iPhone uh, from a website associated with some email that he got. Again, he was worried about being very vulnerable right now with this uh, potential refund of some crypto coming back to his account through his phone. And there were a lot of phishing emails going on. And so he was worried that he perhaps maybe have downloaded a file by, by mistake. He couldn't find the file anywhere. And he's worried that he might be infected. So... Again, I implored him to seek out some professional advice if it was a lot of money involved uh, and he was really worried about this to, uh, to, to seek out some other advice and I gave him some, some examples. But I did have some general advice and I'll pass that on to you as well. So first of all, if you're on an iPhone, uh, there's a files app now. Uh, so if you do have a file that you've downloaded, if you open the files app, you should be able to find it there. Also, of course, you wanna follow all the standard protector procedures. You want, you wanna make sure you've got a pin code on your phone. You can set up face ID or touch ID. On the iPhone in particular, and I, actually, I think David asked me about this specifically, there's something called lockdown mode now, and I told him he should absolutely enable lockdown mode, at least until this particular situation is resolved. It's really not that intrusive, and it adds a lot more security to your phone, especially if you're worried about potentially getting, you know, zero-click exploits uh, and things like that. I'm not sure. He never told me if, how much money we're talking about here, but he was pretty worried about it, uh, and that's really, honestly, all I needed to know. So uh, I gave him that advice. I also told him that if he's worried, he should reboot his phone periodically. A lot of this malware, especially on smartphones, doesn't have the ability to persist. Uh, it's just in RAM. So uh, once you're infected, you'll stay infected until you reboot your phone. That's often enough to wipe it away. Now, of course, you could get reinfected. So, I, you know, I recommended that he do this periodically. I also recommended that he might want to install the iVerify app. We talked to those guys last fall. Uh, it's a great app. I've got it on my phone. Not only does it have some great built-in security and forensic mechanisms for trying to figure out if you're infected, it's got some great checklists for helping your privacy and security built into the app. And then I also recommended that he check out maybe How to Catch a Fish, the, the book from uh, Nick Oles, who we uh, interviewed last year. And it, honestly, at this point, I think he's in the realm of the Michael Bazell Extreme Privacy books. Michael has a lot of interesting security tips as well. So I recommended that he might want to check out those books as well. So again, the bottom line really for me for this particular story is when you do ask me a question that I don't think I'm qualified to answer, or I'm afraid to be the person to give you a wrong answer. If it's, you know, if it's, you know, if it's a stalking situation or uh, something involving a lot of money, uh, something like that, I will still refer you as best I can to sources that I think can help you. 
So there is your mailbag. We've caught up on a lot of Dear Carrie questions. So again, if you want to send me your questions, you can send them to Dear Carrie at Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. If you want some more details on how to do that, including how you can send me an audio snippet of yourself asking the question, if you do so, I will be happy to play that on the air. Go to fdsd.me slash QNA. Your email address will be thrown in the virtual hat for a monthly drawing of a free copy of my book if you do that. And oftentimes these questions give me some really interesting ideas for things to put on the show. So I very much appreciate these questions. Feel free to send them to me. All right, so we don't have a whole lot more time, but I'm going to do a quick tip of the week since we normally would have done that on a new show. And I want to address a couple things. First of all, if you're an AT&T cellular customer, I think even uh, some of their affiliated accounts, I talked two weeks ago about uh, a breach where AT&T was denying that they were hacked, but nevertheless, there were 73 million accounts worth of data on the dark web that sure looked a lot like AT&T accounts. Uh, well, they have confirmed that that is the case. They are now resetting people's account pins, the four digit security pins that I often tell you you should put on your account. Apparently those were compromised. So you should, if you haven't already expect to hear something from AT&T. And if not, I would probably reach out and, and find out what's going on and see if you can reset your security pin or set one. If you haven't done that yet, you should definitely do that. So I wanted to give you a heads up about that. But also, I want to do a little quick take on TikTok. This has been in the news a lot. Honestly, I think a little bit too much, or I think it was been covered the wrong way, but it's a, it's a real mess. And so I, I wanted to kind of give you my take on this. And I'll, I'll try to keep it short. First of all, I absolutely 100% understand the squeamishness we have about a Chinese-owned company having access to a lot of phones and potentially a lot of information about the people who own those phones, given how companies work in China, that there is a definite relationship and communication between any Chinese owned company and the Chinese government. They will go to great lengths to say that nothing's going on. TikTok in particular has gone to great lengths to try to separate uh, U.S. data I think they tried to put it into servers in Texas. Uh, you know, they've tried to address this. This is, we've been complaining about them. Our government has been complaining about TikTok for many years now. But it's come to a head recently because the House just passed a law that would allow the government to ban TikTok from U.S. app stores unless ByteDance, the company that owns TikTok, basically sells itself out to a non-Chinese company. And China has made it very clear that that is never going to happen. Or if it does happen, <laughs> they're going to gut the company because they're not going to allow the algorithm that is running TikTok to, to leave the country, basically, which sounds suspicious. But I mean, any company would do this, Fi you know, Facebook and others wouldn't would do the same thing. They would want to keep their intellectual property. And there have been some troubling stories um, about TikTok and how employees have gotten access to data that has been targeting journalists, for example. There is some shady stuff going on. But I think we're looking at this the wrong way, and I think we're doing the wrong thing. There is also a lot of upside, I hate to say it, to some of these social media apps. There's 170 million people in the U.S. alone that use this app. There are a lot of people that make money, that like their living is tied to doing things on TikTok. And banning that app is going to cause a lot of problems. Uh, in an election year, I think it's going to really <laughs> have some negative blowback that our representatives are not carefully considering, for, for example. But putting the politics aside, let's look at the real issue here. And that is <sighs> data gathering and privacy and the lack of privacy protections in the U.S. and uh, a lot of other places as well. Yes, TikTok is gathering probably a lot of information about us. But so is Facebook, so is Instagram, so is Snapchat, so is Google, um, so is Twitter. They all do it the same way. They all gather this data. They all use that data to sell ads to us. Um, they have algorithms that feed us stuff that keep us engaged. And a lot of times that algorithm feeds us bad stuff. That could be misinformation. It could be disinformation. Uh, it could be used by nefarious third parties to push agendas and propaganda. They all have this vulnerability. They can all be used in this way. And they are all being used in this way. So there's the propaganda side and there's the data side. 
on the propaganda side, I'm not sure what you can do really, because there's a lot of free speech issues going on here. First of all, there's the, the speech of the people posting on these services. And as long as it is a real person doing the posting, you are taking away an avenue for people to have free expression. Now, these are all private companies. Um, there's no First Amendment stuff going on, for example, in the United States, because they're private companies. That As long as the government is not saying you must carry this content or you must not carry this content, and there are those things going on as well, these platforms are free to do whatever they want. And solving the problem of, of misinformation and disinformation is not going to be easy. So I'm not going to try to tackle that too much right now. Uh, but they all do it. And, and honestly, even if ByteDance was sold off to an American company, the Chinese Communist Party or Russia or North Korea or Iran, they will all have many, many other ways to reach us with misinformation and disinformation and propaganda. Taking away TikTok or selling it off to a non-Chinese company is not going to stop that. Furthermore, it's also not going to stop the rampant data collection and all these serious, serious privacy and security problems that come with that, including national security problems. China could buy this information today from data brokers and many other places without needing TikTok. Yes, it's a lot easier if they could do it through TikTok. Sure, I get that. But just banning TikTok is not going to solve this. What we really need is we need true data privacy laws. That won't solve all these problems, but at least it's attempting to address the root problem, the real root problem with all of these social media networks and applications and data brokers. I, and I just think, unfortunately, a lot of what's going on is just performative. Uh, China is an easy boogeyman. Uh, there's a lot of xenophobia around that, that this is playing to, and it's really muddying up the issue. And I, I, at the end of the day, I understand why they're doing this. I'm not saying I'm not concerned. I'm not saying I don't understand how... TikTok is in some ways special. For example, uh, you may not know, but TikTok is not allowed in China, at least not the version that we have. They have a different version of TikTok in China. And they also, China doesn't allow our social media. In fact, I'm kind of surprised that the, the tack we didn't take here was, well, if you're not going to allow Facebook and Twitter in China, then we're not going to allow TikTok in America. But that is not the angle they took. So anyway, that's kind of my take on this. It's really messy. It's muddy. It's not clear. Uh, there's a lot of nuance to this that I think is getting glossed over. Uh, I'm going to put a link to one or two articles in the show notes uh, that I would recommend that you read if you want some more information on this. But I just wanted to kind of give you my take because it's all been all over the news. And I just want to let you know where I stood on this. So there you have it. There is your mailbag and your tip of the week. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Obviously, we missed a bunch of news this week. Uh, I'll be back with a big news show in two weeks. As always, if there's anything super exciting or super urgent or critical, I will usually post that to my social media accounts. If you want to you know, follow me there, I usually post to Twitter, Mastodon, and Facebook when there's something that I think can't really wait for a news show. So you might want to follow me there. All right, next week, we've got our interview with Joe Mullen from the EFF. We'll talk about the Kids Online Safety Act, which is a horrible bill with a, a name that's kind of hard to say no to. But we're going to dig into all of that next week. And then later on, I've got an interview with Seth for Privacy on CBDCs, or Central Bank Digital Currency, which is kind of like government-backed crypto. And a wonderful interview with Dina Temple-Raston, where we talk about the cyber war going on between Ukraine and Russia, and what we should all be learning from that. So subscribe if you haven't. That way you won't miss any of that. And if you think about it, drop a really nice five-star review on the, on the podcast. That would be great as well. All right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Take care. Stay safe out there. And until next week, as always, don't get caught with your drawbridge down. Mm -hmm.